um, uh, what's going on in the brain in people who have FND. But alongside that, it's become increasingly clear to me that if we're ever going to move anywhere soon, we really need a, a structure, a sort of pathway for people with FND. Because the problem is, and the thing that I hear so often from people is that it's just such a nightmare to get any help right from the very beginning. But also, even when you finally get a diagnosis, it's so hard to access any sort of treatment. And often nobody seems to know what the right thing is to do. And uh, I think in any complicated condition, you need a care pathway. So that means that there needs to be some sort of structure because people with F and D are not all the same. They have different types of symptoms. There's different other problems they might have with different severities. Um, and that means that you need different types of treatment. So it's not just a one size fits all treatment, but there's something more bespoke. And I suppose that's, that's what a care pathway is. It's trying to understand how you would ideally try and organize care. So somebody with FND turns up in a doctor's surgery or an A&E, what should be the right thing that happens to that person? And if that doesn't work, what happens next? So I'm involved with others in the UK trying to develop a care pathway, uh, trying to get it accepted by the, the health um, authorities as a reasonable way to go, um, and also then trying to implement it. Now, all of those things take quite a long time, but we're getting there, I think, with uh, uh, an agreement to think about how should people with FND go through the health system and how could we make it better than it is today? Because if we have something like that set up, then it's much easier then to do clinical trials and to do research and try and really push the agenda. But in a situation where so many people with FND are just completely lost without any help at all, um, I think we need to do something about that now, um, alongside trying to develop the science and, and better treatments. Absolutely, especially where it seems to be, according to research, that the sooner that patients can access that treatment, the better off yeah. they typically tend to be. Am I correct? Yeah, 100%. So uh, the, the sooner that somebody with FND can get a diagnosis that's understandable and can get into some reasonable treatment, the better the chances of that person doing well in the long term. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't always work like that, but that's the, what happens on average. And I've seen many, many people, and I'm sure many people out there um, uh, know people like this as well, where people have struggled for years to get a diagnosis and then a very, very long time after that to get any sort of treatment. And that just doesn't work. Uh, it's not good enough, really. Uh, it's not what we would expect for people with other conditions. So we shouldn't really put up with it for people who have FND. I absolutely agree. And I know that all of our panelists are participants agree as well. There's been too many years that that has gone on. Uh, we want to take some questions and that is going to be primarily our focus today is to answer some questions. So we just want to remind those that are participating that there is a Q&A. They can put their question in there and we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Uh, again, that's in the Q&A, not the chat. It's, it's a little more difficult for us to see them in the chat. So if you can put them in that Q&A, that'd be great. Uh, we have one question uh, here, and it's, as we know, not everyone who has FND suffered from mental health problems in the past. Um, the term functional indicates that it's psychological, which makes me feel depressed. How can I deal with this? I think there's a couple things there I'm sure you can. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a really, really important question. So I think that the word psychological is a very tricky one because uh, what that would mean to a scientist is something that's very different, I think, from what it means out there in the general public and actually also amongst a lot of doctors. So I think that often when the term psychological is used, it's really meaning somehow not real or made up or put on or trivial or not genuine, all of these sorts of things. And that's just not true. Uh, what we're talking about with functional neurological disorder is a malfunction of the way the brain is working. And it's a real thing. If you could look inside the brain, which actually we can with certain tests, you can see that it is not functioning correctly. The networks of nerve cells are not working together properly. And that's why things are going wrong. And so that term functional is trying to make a bit of a distinction between that sort of a problem and 
problems caused by structural damage and degeneration to nerve cells, which also can cause neurological symptoms and are also real things. So they're two real things. There's not a real thing and a not real thing. So the term functional is trying to talk about this malfunction. And on, the, on this subject of psychological, I think that uh, there are many ways of thinking about that. So we can think about psychological in terms of things like depression or anxiety, so mental health diagnoses, but we can also talk, think about them, about the way the brain is working, about how we are as a person and how we communicate with our bodies. So that's a psychological thing as well. So when I lift up my arm like this, somehow I'm telling my body to do that. And in people with FND, that process doesn't work properly. So is that a psychological problem? I'm not sure. I, I mean, it, 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 it's involving mental processes in the way that I am communicating with my body. So in that sense, that's a psychological process, but it doesn't mean it's psychological, i.e. it's trivial, or if I actually thought about it, I could not have it. So right. I think these words are just really, really, really difficult. And I think the word psychological has a lot of rehabilitation to go through. But FND is a real condition. It is nobody's fault. Um, it's not something that people want to have or could not have just by thinking about it differently. And I think that that's such an important place to start this entire discussion because often, and I, and I think people are sometimes equating psychological to maybe this is a behavior type yeah. issue. And that's where that confusion kind of comes in because the brain and mind is one, you know, where, how you separate the two, which makes that, I'm sure, difficult to try to explain that there's really not, not this dichotomy of. So, so it doesn't, it, it, you cannot separate the mind from the brain. It's in the same place. Um, and I think that what, what really matters is to understand that FND is a real problem. It may be different in its mechanism from having MS, but MS is different in its mechanism from having dementia. But it's, you know, these are just different, they're just different ways in which the brain can go wrong. And right. makes, to me, it makes perfect sense that FND exists from how we know the brain is wired up and put together. In fact, it would be bizarre if FND didn't exist because there is an interface between us and our bodies and that interface is extremely complicated and it is not voluntary. It is not just something that you can control in an easy way. It's a very complicated process in the brain and that's the bit that goes wrong in FND. So we know that bit exists and it can definitely go wrong and we would predict the symptoms that people get in FND if that bit of the brain went wrong. So it's no more or less valuable or genuine a condition than anything else. But I completely appreciate that the way that doctors and lots of people out there think about it is very, very different. And that partly comes from the fact that we're, we're sort of uh, got this thing in society that the brain is split in this way. And if you haven't got something which is sort of damage you can see on the scan, then of course it's not real. And that's just nonsense. But unfortunately, that's where we are in terms of understanding. Uh, from a lot of people out there, including a lot of doctors and health professionals. And it's a long process of trying to change it. Well, and another question is asking about, is conversion disorder and FND the same diagnosis? And that kind of plays, kind of feeds into the this same question that you're discussing as well. Okay. Uh, so from, from a technical point of view, in one particular diagnostic uh, book, if you like, um, uh, conversion disorder and functional neurological disorder are the same diagnosis. But uh, conversion disorder to me, and to a lot of people, I think, it, it reflects a theory. It reflects a theory uh, developed over 100 years ago about why people might develop FND. And that is a theory that FND develops because there is a conversion of psychological distress or traumatic experiences into physical symptoms as a sort of defense mechanism from, from the brain. That was always suggested to be completely involuntary. It wasn't people that, that people wanted to do that, but that was the theory. And that's why it's called conversion disorders. It's converting one thing to another. However, what's very clear is that that 
story of psychological distress converted into physical symptoms doesn't fit for lots and lots of people. So lots of people can have FND without significant traumatic experiences. And also it doesn't really necessarily fit very well with how the brain's put together. Um, or at least it's very complicated how what I would think of as risk factors change into people having an illness. So if we take a different example of somebody having a stroke, a doctor would usually ask lots of questions of that person. So they'd say, do you smoke? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? And lots of other things, because we know that people who smoke or have high blood pressure or high cholesterol are at greater risk of getting a stroke. But uh, that doesn't mean everyone who's had a stroke is a smoker or has high blood pressure. And obviously there's lots of people who smoke and have high blood pressure who haven't had a stroke. But also that kind of discussion is only part of what you might be doing because you're still going to be treating somebody's stroke. You might be giving them medication, you might be giving them rehabilitation. So the same is true of FND. I think it's a reasonable thing for people to ask about what's been going on in people's lives in general uh, before they developed FND because some people have active traumatic experiences which remain very difficult and sometimes that's a relevant part of treatment. But then there's people who, where that's not relevant, people may have had traumatic experiences but they're not relevant now, people have never had traumatic experiences and there's a huge number of other things that you might want to do to try and help the person with FND. So another question that just follows right along with that is, is there a difference in the treatment approach that you would take if there's a definite emotional or traumatic event connection versus uh, maybe some cash, you know, risk, other risk factors? So, so the answer is maybe, yes. I think the most important thing, and unfortunately this often doesn't happen because it takes a lot of time, the most important thing is to have a long time to talk to the person who has FND and try and understand all of the different things that are going on. Because not only may be, there be um, risk factors, there may be other diagnoses. Those can be mental health diagnoses, but they can also be physical health diagnoses. Um, there may be other things going, you know, you want to understand the whole situation. So uh, in some people who've had traumatic experiences, um, treatment from that point of view can be relevant, but it's not everybody. And the reason for that is that uh, it's actually very complicated when people have had traumatic experiences, particularly early in life, to understand whether there's any reason to be digging things up from the past and going over them again, because that is that is itself can be a very traumatic experience. It can sometimes make people a lot worse. And so this very simplistic idea that, oh, well, if somebody's got FND and you've uncovered some, or you've, there is some trauma in the past, that you have to put all of your efforts into working on that and working through it somehow. That's not true. It's a situation where it may in very particular circumstances and with a lot of professionalism and advice, it may be a reasonable thing to do, uh, but uh, it's, it's not always the case. And you need to think about it on an individual basis. Um, and like I was saying before, there are many things that one can do that are really just looking at the symptoms somebody has for FND and thinking of ways in which you might be able to treat those, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with past trauma or other diagnoses or whatever. And another question was, is if someone doesn't access treatment for a considerable amount of time, is that mean they're gonna have it for the rest of their life? And then so, on the other side of that, someone that maybe's had treatment and is doing better, is it is it something that they will always need to manage or do people both, never both walk away and have it again? So, I think the way I would think about people who've had a long history of symptoms is that there is always the theoretical possibility of improvement with FND, but I think it does become more and more difficult the longer people have had symptoms. And that's for a variety of different reasons. Um, there's, there's just the having of symptoms for a very long period of time. There are all of the changes that happen to people's lives as a result of disability from FND. 
and that produces its own problems. There's things that happen to the body itself when it's not used. So if somebody has very, very long standing weakness, for example, maybe they haven't stood up for 10 years, that's something which just from, you know, whatever the cause of that was, that would be a tricky thing, but not an impossible thing to overcome. So it does become more difficult, but it, I don't want to say that it's impossible or that people should give up hope um, because sometimes things do improve. Um, I think if people have had symptoms and they've had treatment and things have improved, I think there is always a, a chance of relapse or return of symptoms. But I think that if people have got better with treatment, often if symptoms do tend to come back a little bit, often people have techniques that they can use to get some symptoms suppressed again. So what I most often hear from people who've done well over time is that they're still having to do things day to day to keep their symptoms in check. They're very much in the background, but they're still having to manage things in their life day to day to make sure that symptoms stay away. And I think that's what real recovery is. It probably isn't just it almost being disappeared. It's that actually from the outside, people may be seem completely fine, but they may still have to be doing things sometimes uh, to keep things as well as possible. Absolutely. Um, another question is uh, a participant has said they get frustrated by doctors who see FND and think psychological and then stop helping them. Hmm. Um, yet physical therapists, speech therapists, and all these other, um, they think it's not psychological. So they feel like that, you know, it goes back to that treatment and trying to bridge those gaps to find help. Well, that, that's, that's a perfect example to me of using the word, of, I'm not talking about the participant, but the, the doctor in that situation, using the word psychological to say, there's nothing wrong or there's nothing seriously wrong, or you know, there's nothing, it's not really up to me to help you. So that's nonsense. So there's lots of things that can be done to help people with FND with, you know, with the right support. So that can include psychological therapy. So psychological therapy is not just about depression and anxiety. It can be ways of managing symptoms. It can be ways of yeah, controlling symptoms. It can be ways of dealing with the impact of symptoms on day-to-day -day life. But then the other things that were mentioned, like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, pain management therapy, you know, there's lots of things that can be done. And also neurologists staying involved. So I think that one of the things that's very important is that if, if people have persistent symptoms, that they still have some contact with somebody from the medical profession, probably a neurologist, um, who's there to give advice about new symptoms that might develop, to give advice about medications that people might be on, to keep people up to date with any developments in treatment that might be relevant, just like you would for anything else. So I think the most, the, the thing which I, when I talk to doctors about FND, is I just try and to, to get it as simple as possible. You just need to treat people like you would treat anybody else with a cause of neurological symptoms. That's all you have to do to make everybody's lives better is just do what you do for everybody else, for people with FND. Because you wouldn't take somebody with MS, um, even if you didn't have any drugs for MS, you wouldn't take someone with MS and say, oh, you've got MS, uh, that's it then, bye-bye. You would actually try and offer help. And even if you couldn't do anything, you might try and hold on to that person and support them. Um, and that's what being a doctor is about, I think. Um, Absolutely. In neurology. Absolutely. Uh, you know, why do you think that that there's a tendency for doctors to do that? And, and I don't mean like with judgment necessarily, but do you think that it's primarily based because they don't know what to do or, you know, bias? What are some of the... I think that there, there's, a, there's, there's a feeling that they don't know what to do um, and they don't, and it's, and, and to be fair, it is actually quite difficult often to get support for a person. So say, for example, as a neurologist, you think, oh, I think this person with FND and movement problems could really benefit from seeing a neurophysiotherapist. Well, actually, often if you refer to a neurophysiotherapist, a neurophysiotherapist will say, well, I don't see people with FND or I'm not sure really what to do. So as a neurologist, people are often worried that, you know, if they, if they do try and 
take control of the situation and try and get help. They won't be able to get any help. Um, and I think there's also this feeling that maybe it's not really their thing because maybe a psychiatrist should be looking after the person. And this comes back to this whole brain mind split again, because often when people go to see a psychiatrist, psychiatrists may not really know what to do. So uh, I think that's where trying to have, like we was talking about at the beginning, a care pathway. So if you can have a way of getting good advice for health professionals and for people with FND within a pathway. So that means that a doctor can make the diagnosis and say, well, I know what I can do for you. I can refer you to this clinic where they have some understanding of, of FND and they might be able to access you some services. And ideally that clinic wouldn't be just one in a country or just two or three, it would be everywhere. Just like there is a clinic for MS and a clinic for Parkinson's disease um, in most places. So, uh, I think that's the way to get, you know, uh, better advice more quickly. Absolutely. The another, we have a lot of questions about specific symptoms and what maybe works for some specific sure. ones. Um, one in particular is people with dystonia and spasms that are mostly in their face. Um, are there specific treatments that kind of work for like, if you have paralysis versus movement or dystonia or any of that or yeah so so i think with movement symptoms so that's weakness uh jerk spasms dystonia etc um typically uh physiotherapy based treatment of the right sort can be most helpful but it's not for everybody and i think the main determinant of that that i see in in clinical practice is Sometimes people have movement symptoms like weakness and dystonia and so on, but with enormous amounts of pain or enormous amounts of fatigue or enormous amounts of both. Uh, most people with FND have pain and fatigue, but there are some people where that is a, the sort of overwhelming symptom. Um, so they have movement problems, but really the pain and fatigue drive everything. And they're often very irritable, the pain and fatigue. I mean, so that means that when people do something, which might, might be only a tiny amount of movement or some, some mental activity or whatever it is, then the pain and fatigue ramp up very, very quickly. The reason for sort of stressing that is that people with that situation often don't respond very well to intensive physiotherapy because it's just too much for the system, I think. The system is too sensitive. And in that situation, although it's very seems very tedious and boring, the, the, uh, an, an occupational therapist plus or minus a clinical psychologist might be of more help because they're very used to helping people with persistent pain and fatigue. And a lot of that is about this idea of pacing of activity. So it's about really stripping things back, trying to uh, uh, avoid overdoing things on days when things feel a bit better, even if it's marginally better. And that's a complicated thing to do because most people I meet with FND are very, very driven people. So they tend to push, they're always in their lives, they push very, very hard, done lots and lots of things. That's how they're used to dealing with difficulty is to just work harder. And it, and it works, but with FND it often doesn't work. And it traps people in this cycle of pain and fatigue, but also in a lot of guilt as well, because they can't allow themselves to not push themselves to the brink because that's because that just feels like being lazy and that's made even worse if people are saying there's nothing really wrong or it's all in your mind um so uh you know trying to uh get a balance with day-to-day -day activity and also to try and have some things in your day-to-day -day life even if it's just one thing even once a week which is for you so not for everything to be about managing your symptoms but to maintain some sort of life despite that, which is really, really hard when symptoms are overwhelming. But, you know, for everybody, we, we have to get up for something in the morning. Um, we have to have something in our lives which is, is of something positive and trying to get that into your life as well is very important for dealing with any chronic illness and particularly with FND. So, uh, it, it's very difficult to give precise advice on individual symptoms because it is very individual. Um, 
just to give you an example of that, I, I sit in clinic with a great physiotherapist and probably only about 30% of the people that I see uh, with him uh, who have movement problems, I think are suitable for intensive physiotherapy. So that means there's lots and lots of other people where the treatment probably needs to be longer and involve more of these other sorts of treatments I was mentioning um, alongside physiotherapy. One of the other things that we've noticed is because a lot of people will look for their um, triggers and, you know, can't find them. Or one time it's, you know, it's maybe something, another time it's something else. And we found that more of trigger stacking is kind of a way that we've been putting it, that maybe this one thing didn't bother you last time, but when you add it with now, maybe you took a shower today, which can be very exhausting for some, and then you cook dinner for your family. And now you've had a friend over and that was just too much. So learning to find where that threshold is, is really important. And, and like you said, making sure that there is a time that your friend, or you can have that fun a little bit. Yeah. So it is, it is really hard. And, and I'm sure for lots of people out there, it's difficult when, when I'm talking in these sort of generalities about, about different professionals who could be involved or different ideas, because it is a very individual thing. Um, but, and I, I, th I think don't drive yourself crazy looking for triggers because they, they often are there to some extent, but they're often complicated as well. And sometimes things just happen randomly. Um, uh, so uh, it's worthwhile being alert to that and thinking about it, but don't let it dominate your life too much. Um, and triggers can sometimes change a bit over time as well. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. And, and, you know, as we're looking through some of the questions, we've got a lot in here, but there are a lot of common themes um, amongst them. And, and so we're kind of trying to hit some of those. Uh, one of the other, of course, familiar questions is about uh, working and finding some help. Um, hmm. Neurologists and brain scans. Let's, let's maybe touch on some of those, some of the research, a couple of questions here on if they have lesions on their brain, is that mean that they shouldn't have an FND diagnosis? Sometimes that um, is an issue. Also, you know, what are we finding in some of these scans? And so, so the first one is a really important point and something which, again, I don't mean to, I'm not mean to bash health professionals, but to say, I think it's something that health professionals find very difficult to understand as well, is that it is perfectly possible to have FND and another diagnosis at the same time, or to have FND and then develop a new medical problem, or to have a, have a medical problem before and then you develop FND. So in fact, most people, a lot of people with FND have more than one diagnosis. And so that's really important. It's really important when you're assessing somebody, first of all, because you wanna think about all of the different things that are possibly going on from a physical and mental health point of view, um, and that can include doing investigations and it include thinking about the results of investigations carefully. So for example, in work done by John Stone in Scotland, about 20% of people, maybe 15% of people who have a, uh, another neurological diagnosis, whether that's Parkinson's, MS, nerve problems, et cetera, um, also have FND. So this sort of comorbidity is a very common thing, uh, but it often gets a bit lost the other situation where it gets lost is if people have a diagnosis of FND, which is correct, but then they develop new symptoms. And often it's very difficult to get people to ass assess those new symptoms with an open mind because people will say, oh, it's the FND. Um, and that's a, a dangerous thing to do really because uh, it can often be resolved with just a simple clinical examination, but it needs somebody to look at the problem, the new symptom with an open mind and think about it. And I, I have patients with FND who later on develop other problems, but that's not because the FND puts them at risk, particularly. it's just that that's life. That's what happens to some people. Um, so I think the, the bottom line is that if you develop new symptoms or you have things in your test results, which you can't, don't understand, it's important to get an answer to that. Um, so in terms of research, I think that a lot of research has been done looking at uh, using uh, MRI, in mainly using what's called functional MRI, which is looking at, effectively looking at blood flow in the brain. 
So the idea is that if a bit of the brain is active at a particular time, then there's more blood going there. Um, and so I suppose the earlier studies from, F from fMRI were useful just in convincing people if they needed convincing that FND is a real thing. Because in lots of those early studies, what they would do is take people with FND, for example, with weakness of one leg and people who were pretending to have weakness of the leg and to see what happened to the brain activity when they were asked to move their leg. And in people who were pretending to move their leg, oh, sorry, pretending to have weakness, um, there was nothing that happened because they were pretending to have weakness. In people with FND, what would happen is that you saw areas in the brain lighting up that were involved in preparing movement, but then other bits of the brain, which shouldn't be involved in preparing movement, turned on and the movement didn't happen. And those bits were generally at the front of the brain, which are involved in the brain's focus of attention. So where the brain is directing its attention and also in some other studies in what are called limbic areas. So these are areas of the brain involved in emotional processing or feelings. Um, it's difficult to know exactly what those mean, except clearly FND is a real thing. Um, and also it's a brain process involving networks in the brain, which are coming on when they shouldn't be there and they're interfering with normal automatic function in the brain. Uh, there have been studies which are looking at the structure of the brain as well. Now, this word functional suggests that there shouldn't be a structural problem in the brain. But what studies have suggested in people who've had FND for a long time, uh, so most of these studies conducted with people who've had FND for years and years and years, is that when you group all of those scans together, they do look a little bit different than scans of people who are healthy. And that suggests that in the long term, this malfunction of the way the brain's working is probably changing the structure of the brain a little bit, which coming back to the, one of the earlier questions may be why when people have had symptoms for a very, very long time, it's less likely, but not impossible, that things would improve. I, I think that what, what a lot of research now is trying to do is trying to understand how it is that we might be able to connect together all of these different strands that appear in risk factors for FND. So the, there's known risk factors, which are, we've talked about already around trauma, that's fine. But there are other risk factors which are much less well understood. Uh, so for example, I see a lot of people who have hypermobility of their joints. So that's a collagen problem in the joints, makes people double jointed, but it seems to also have a, a association with FND. There are lots of patients that I uh, meet who have children or have relatives with autism uh, or autism, autism, autistic spectrum disorder. And there are some patients who also have autistic spectrum disorder more than I would expect by chance. So how does that fit into all of this? Um, and I think probably the way that it does fit in in the end is that we're talking about the way in which sort of the conscious person can communicate with the body in terms of getting it to move and then can get information up from the body about what is going on in the body. And that's about sensations and so on, but it's also about the internal bit of the body. And it's also about emotions as well, because emotions are in the body. When you're excited, your heart might beat fast. When you're frightened, actually the same thing might happen, but your brain needs to sort of interpret what's going on. And there's something about this disconnection between person and their body, which is fundamental to FND, and may also be uh, help us understand some of the risk factors too. Um, thank you. You kind of touched on a lot of different questions there that we that we had. Um, kind of turning our direction to another um, focus is a question regarding pregnancy. And oh. we have had a few parents that have gone through that process and um, we've, we've kind of heard within their groups a variation, some doing better, some not. What is your experience um, with patients going through that? And is it hereditary? You kind of touched on that again or? So, so I think uh, to maybe dealing with that, the hereditary thing, first of all, I, I think that it's hard to think of any medical condition that, pro that doesn't have some genetic component to it, okay? But what we're talking about with FND, if there was a genetic component, is something which is very, very complicated. 
So what I mean by that is it wouldn't ever be something where you would find a single gene and it would run in the family and every generation, you know, there are some illnesses like that, but FND is definitely not one of them. Uh, I think there may be risk factors, uh, sorry, uh, genetic uh, relevance in some of the risk factors. So I was talking about hypermobility, that's an inherited trait. Autistic spectrum disorder, that's somewhat inherited. But all of that inheritance is very complicated. It's a bit like blood pressure probably, where there's probably a thousand genes all working together in different complicated combinations that produce a, a little bit of change in risk. But certainly I wouldn't ever suggest that people with FND should be worried about having children or worried about their children because they have FND from the point of view of inheriting the condition. It's not likely to be like that. Um, I, I have uh, met and looked after a, a few people who have FND and have become pregnant when they're FND and have FND had children. I, my experience is also quite mixed, like you were saying, Bridget, in that I think uh, for some people it hasn't really made any difference to symptoms at all. Uh, some people, they seem to have gone through a period of worsening of symptoms during pregnancy and afterwards. Uh, one person I can think of actually got quite a bit better. Um, so it's, it's, it's very variable. And so that's what I would say to people who are considering pregnancy, who do have FND, is that it's just really difficult to know. I think that if your symptoms are extremely severe and you are really struggling to manage your day-to-day -day life with the way symptoms are, then um, it's probably going to be difficult adding to that mix having a small child because that's stressful and difficult physically for everybody. But I'm very cautious about making judgments about that uh, because having a child is a very, very personal decision. And I think that, you know, and it's a decision which affects your entire life. And so I wouldn't want to sort of take authority for that away from the person and the family themselves, uh, really. Absolutely. And thank you for touching on that as well, because it is a personal, uh, you know, what you feel like you can handle. And it's definitely would be something that you need to discuss, but also know that it, it could make things worse or, or maybe not, you know, but something to kind of, I guess, cross that bridge when you come to it. Uh, we have another interesting question. I hope I don't mess it up. Uh, it says, have you heard of using transcutaneous vagal and trigem tri trigeminal nerve stimulation or repetitive somatosensory stimulation to treat FND? So, I didn't box that too bad. So, so this is all, it's a good question. And it's talking about lots of different techniques that can be used to sort of get signals into the brain. So you can do that by giving electric shocks to the body. So that's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. So people might have heard of that as TENS. So you can buy TENS machines from pharmacies. They, they can be used sometimes as a treatment for pain. Um, and then there are um, ways of stimulating nerves directly. So the person talked about vagal nerve stimulation. You can stimulate the brain directly with electric, electrical stimulation or electromagnetic stimulation, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. But they're all ways of trying to get signals into the brain somehow. So I think they're all very interesting techniques. Um, but the evidence out there for um, uh, how, um, uh, how, how they work or whether they will be useful is pretty limited. The most evidence is for transcranial magnetic stimulations, so-called TMS. And that's been used quite a lot, particularly in France, as a way of trying to trigger movement in people who have functional paralysis. Um, so if you hold this coil over part of the motor part of the brain and you turn up the machine enough, you can get, you can stimulate the nerve cells underneath and you can get a limb, for example, to twitch. And that's what's been used mainly as a treatment for paralysis. So um, the person can't move their leg. And the idea is you're sort of um, from externally triggering movement and getting movement to happen. And somehow that feedback might kick the circuit back into working again. Um, so there's been a few papers published with that and with some positive results. Um, uh, I've used it occasionally. Uh, I haven't had particularly good experience, but that may be because I'm seeing people who've had symptoms for a very long time, whereas most of the people treated in the French series are people who've only recently developed symptoms. Um, I think that it, 
this whole idea I was talking about earlier of a disconnection between the person and the body, I think makes these techniques quite interesting because they're a way of externally kind of getting stuff either with electric shocks, getting sort of sensation information back into the brain or with this magnetic stimulation, getting movement information back into the body. So I could see them as possibly useful, but they're just, just something that needs a lot more work to understand how you would introduce them. Uh, but I'm certainly, yeah, I find them interesting as techniques. Are there any other um, up and coming therapies or treatments that are showing some promising results, um, which may not have the research backing yet or any other anecdotal guidance? Yeah. So I think a, a, a lot of, um, a lot of research, a lot of research focuses is on techniques that we know about already. And what we're trying to do is to prove that they work to a standard, which would mean, so the standard of proof is enough that people will take them seriously. So in, uh, in, in drug development, for example, the, the gold standard of what every drug company wants, if they have a drug they think it works, is what's called a double blind placebo controlled trial. So that's where the patient themselves and the doctors don't know whether the person is getting the real treatment or not. Uh, and people are randomly assigned to the real treatment or not. And then you see what happens. It's difficult to do that with rehabilitation. Um, so physiotherapy or psychological therapy or multidisciplinary rehabilitation. But there's trials ongoing which are trying to do that. And the reason why it's so important is that if we can prove that treatment works in that sort of controlled trial setting, then it is very difficult for health services to say that we won't fund that treatment or that there isn't, this isn't a relevant treatment because it's proper proof that it works. So a lot of efforts have been going into that kind of thing to basically prove the stuff we already kind of know works, but to show that it does. Um, and so we can prove, we can get it out there for people to be able to access. In terms of experimental treatments, I think most of them are around this brain stimulation or peripheral nerve stimulation. So trying to get information in in a different way. Um, in terms of drugs, there are um, possibilities, I think, in terms, so, so uh, several years ago, John Stone published his experience on using uh, a drug called propofol, which is an anesthetic, but it's basically using it in a particular way so where you get people into a sort of twilight state where they're still awake, but not really. Um, and in that situation, try and get them to access movement. So that it was many people with movement problems. And, uh, you know, some people did seem to reconnect with their bodies after that. Um, I think there may be other medications out there that can that uh, can change this relationship between people and their bodies. Uh, there may be things which are sometimes, um, you know, there's a drug which has been used in chronic pain treatment called ketamine, which does that. Um, there's maybe even a role for, for uh, drugs which used to be used as hallucinogenic drugs. But all of these things are very, they're very difficult to know. And it's also, I find it difficult to talk about that or to think about planning trials for that end of things when we can't even get somebody a diagnosis properly or can't even get somebody physiotherapy or you know, a psychological therapy or multidisciplinary treatment, things which we know can be useful. But I think that in the future, we will have other treatments, particularly aimed at people who with current therapies are completely stuck. So there's a group of people who are doing their very best. They've had really good quality multidisciplinary treatment, but they're just stuck. And that's a group of people I think would most, the most relevant, these sorts of more experimental treatments um, to see if we can get something that works for them. And something individual. Another question is uh, that goes along with these treatments is what is the role of positive thinking and what are the limitations or risks to believing that we can think our way out of symptoms? Yeah, it's a really good question and something which again touches on a lot of, you know, I, I can't lose count of the number of people who've told me that, you know, the first doctor who told me say, said, you know, uh, there's nothing seriously wrong, it'll all be better, um, you just have to have to just have to believe it uh, or you know again similar sort of thing you know the the only thing you need to do is believe the diagnosis and then everything will be okay and that's just just not true um, 
And that's where the danger is, I think, about this idea that people can just think themselves better. Um, on the other side of that, it is true that with any medical problem, the way that you think about it and the way that you behave with it and the way that people around you behave with it makes a difference. I mean, it stands to reason. So if somebody has a stroke and they just say, I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to give up. And when somebody comes and says, would you like some physiotherapy today? I say, no, um, they're probably not going to do that well. Um, whereas a person who has a different attitude, who engages with it, has you know, is thinking positively about what might change, is probably going to do a bit better. But nobody would expect that just positive thinking would make somebody with a stroke leap out of bed and just be better. Um, so that's where the difference is. That's what people sometimes expect, I think, of people with FND, that it's just going to dramatically make everything better. Um, but it obviously does make a difference. Of course it makes a difference because we're human beings, not robots. So the way that we feel and the way that people are acting around us and the way that they make us feel, it really makes a difference. Um, and so that is another area of life to concentrate on, you know, in terms of trying to improve the situation overall. I think that goes also for the, the health professionals you have around you, the people that you choose to go and see, the people that you might decide not to see again, is people who can support you in that uh, rather than be a, a sort of negative force. That's really important to keep that in mind is, you know, who you surround yourself with and trying to maintain. And that would go with any illness, as you, as you mentioned, that's, you know, we've really talked about this COVID and isolation and, and, you know, I have to wonder how many of our members actually find that much of a difference in their day versus, you know, before everything, um, because they were kind of un unfortunately subjected to a lot of isolation. Yeah. Um, a couple other questions, and we're, I'm going to try to kind of group a few of them together is, uh, there's been some discussion about maybe dietary changes um, helping and a lot with, there's a lot of new research on like gut microbes and um, the communication pathways, the gut, mind, brain um, yeah. connection. Also a um, couple questions on physical health and trying to maintain fitness. And when your symptoms seem to get worse with, you know, movement, how do you balance that? And what would be your suggestion on yeah. so those together? I think that uh, uh, Many people I meet with FND have had symptoms for a long time, or maybe they haven't had FND for a long time, but they've had other medical problems for a long time. And uh, I think it's always reasonable to get some basic blood tests done about nutrition, so vitamin B12, your vitamin D in particular, um, but also just you know your general health. So are you anemic? Do you have, what's your thyroid function like? So just basic things. Um, because correcting those things, they don't magically make everything better typically, but they can make a difference to how you feel. So it comes back to this idea of thinking about your general health, not just F and D. One point about that I would like to mention is also about sleep. So many people with F and D, because they are immobile and often are given lots of medication, often put on weight. And that can lead to sleep disturbance through sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is when tissues in the throat, they sort of fall back and close the throat partially when you're asleep. It makes people snore heavily, wake up gasping for breath. The reason why that's important is that that's a very treatable problem. Um, and I've met a number of people with FND who are chronically tired during the day. And everybody said, oh, it's the FND, it causes fatigue, which it does. Uh, but they actually had sleep apnea. So thinking broadly about your, your health is very, very important. That goes also for medication as well. So many people are on a stack of medications, some of which are important and may be helping, but many of which are probably not. So having a doctor who could help you go through your medications, maybe try and cut some down, see whether that might improve your overall situation is important. Um, I think that, uh, people who are immobile often get slowed gastric transit. So they get constipation, may even get what's called gastroparesis where the stomach really slows down completely. People might get, might feel very full, they get nausea and vomiting. Um, so those are again, things which, you know, it's, it's part of a 
a proper medical assessment of somebody with FND, particularly with long-standing and relatively severe symptoms, to think about all of the things that are going on and whether some of them might be related to the secondary effects of having an immobilizing, disabling illness, rather than all being related to the FND itself and trying to then sort of pick them apart. Um, uh, I think that was, and then you asked me something else about uh, the fitness and yes. uh, <laughs> yeah. So it, it is it is very, very hard if people have that sort of irritable pain and fatigue where doing anything kind of flares it up to uh, 100%. Um, I think it's you're trying to make little gains with that, again, with the pacing idea. I think it's very important to have some way of monitoring your activity because it's it's a good way of trying to look, um, trying to develop slow and incremental progress and also to have some way of looking back to think, well, actually today I did 500 steps, you know, a month ago I did 10 or 20. So most mobile phones, in fact, probably all mobile phones have some sort of step counter on them. If you want, you get a watch. So something which is monitoring your activity and gives you a little bit of a benchmark to try and slowly improve against. So being physically fitter is going to help you with your symptoms in general. And that, again, it applies across all different illnesses. It's a very hard thing to do, um, but finding ways of getting some physical activity um, uh, and monitoring it and being able to see some progress over time is important. Thank you. We're starting to run out of time. I'm going to try to get through a few more of these. Uh, a couple questions on related disorders or illnesses, trigeminal neuralgia, um, was one, a uh, couple questions I think on fibromyalgia and pain related to, is there a link to these? Does one cause the other? Um, so I think that that's, that issue about fibromyalgia is a really important one. So if you think about FND as I do as a problem with people being disconnected from their bodies in terms of movement, but also from sensation, that means that sensation messages from the body are not getting into the brain properly or they're not being processed by the brain properly. Now that can lead to loss of sensation. So people might have loss of sensation down one side of the body or below the waist or things like that. But it stands to reason that it could also make sensation feel different. So that might be tingling or numbness, but it could also be pain. So to me, from a scientific point of view, there really isn't a difference in the way I would think about chronic pain as a problem in the compared to the way I would think about FND in general. It's another message coming up to the brain which is being processed wrongly. So many people I meet with FND have previously had chronic pain and have maybe had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And then certainly with FND, people commonly develop chronic pain, which has all the features of fibromyalgia. So that's an important thing to know, I think, because it means that you don't end up collecting lots and lots of different diagnoses. It's just one main thing, but also that some of the treatments that are developed for fibromyalgia and chronic pain, particularly from a rehabilitation point of view, but maybe also from a medication point of view could be relevant. One other thing just quickly to say about pain is that it's very, very common for people to have chronic pain. So the brain is not interpreting messages from the body correctly, but also to have a mechanical cause of pain as well. And sometimes that gets a little bit lost. So it is still reasonable if there's, if somebody seeing you, seeing you and seeing your scan would have in a normal situation said, oh, I think you could benefit from facet joint injections or an epidural. Um, if they, um, you know, just because you have FND doesn't mean that that isn't still the case. Okay, so it's again this idea that you can have more than one thing going on at the same time. You can have FND, which is causing the pain, but also maybe a mechanical cause of pain. And those two things need to be looked at in their own right and treated that way too. Thank you. Uh, another question, and I'm not sure if you have any um, experience with using CBD oil. Um, if, do you know of a studies that are going on? Do you know? Good question. So uh, uh, CBD oil, I think it makes sense that it might change pain sensation and might make people feel 
different. Um, but I think it's probably quite non-specific. I don't think it's a, a sort of miracle thing for FND. I've met some pe people who feel it's been very helpful. Many others, probably the majority who feel it hasn't really made much of a difference. Nobody has said to me it's made them worse. So my general advice is it's okay to try it. It is a bit difficult because it's not pharmaceutically controlled because it's seen as a health food product. So that means you don't really know what is in there. There's no, there's no guarantee of what's in there. And as far as I know, there's not any trials going on on CBD oil in FND. I think you know, CBD comes from cannabis and the idea with CBD oil is you've taken, away, taken out the bit which is psychoactive so that makes you feel psychologically consciously different. Um, uh, I mean, cannabis to me is just another drug. I mean, opiates make you feel different. Um, lots of drugs make you feel different. Um, so uh, hopefully at some point, uh, cannabis will be treated a bit more like an ordinary drug and we can just do an ordinary trial and see whether it works for people or not and what the side effects are, what the benefits are. But at the moment, it's just a bit difficult to know. And again, some people have told me that cannabis makes them feel better. It has a lot of problems because it's illegal in most places to, to get hold of. And again, you don't know what you're getting. But hopefully in the future, there will be a proper trial. But again, I don't think it will be a specific thing for FND. I think it will help some people and probably the majority, it won't make much difference. Um, anything else that uh, either looking at the Q&A that you can see offhand that you can answer um, I apologize, some of the questions come in, I don't quite understand um, exactly. Uh, so you know, the, I, there's one question about donating blood. So donating blood is absolutely fine. There's no restriction on people uh, donating blood. Um, so I think there's something about suppressing symptoms there. So people with uh, dissociative seizures or non-epileptic attacks, um, some people do find that if they try and hold it off, it makes it worse, it comes back stronger. I think that's a situation where really you need to be working with somebody who understands dissociative not seizures or non-epileptic attacks. So the, the uh, clinical psychologists who have specific expertise and the techniques that can be used can help you with that sort of problem of holding off the attack and it coming back worse. Um, another question on surgeries yep. um, and maybe anesthesia, what, do you have any I, connections there or anything? So, I mean, the, so um, I've met a number of people who have developed symptoms in the context of surgery, particularly painful surgery. Um, and I think it's just, uh, so health events as a trigger to the development of FND are very common. So people being ill with something, but that obviously includes having an operation or having accidents. Um, I think uh, for many people with FND, the whole system is very sensitive. So then if you, have an operation, maybe you need an operation for something else, um, it, it can sometimes make the symptoms worse, um, but that should be a transient thing and should settle. Um, obviously, if you need an operation, you need an operation. So the FND shouldn't uh, prevent that from happening. Um, and having an anesthetic, I think of in the same way, sometimes it does flare up symptoms. But again, if you need an anesthetic, you need an anesthetic. Um, uh, there was a question here about coronavirus um, and they, it was said that coronavirus couldn't affect the brain. I'm not sure that they did say that. I think that it's just that coronavirus, maybe they did say that, but uh, coronavirus is something which can affect anybody. People with FND are not particularly sense, uh, uh, more susceptible. It's clear that coronavirus can in some people cause neurological problems. So uh, it does what most viruses do, which is that sometimes it it makes the immune system flare up. And when that happens, it can sometimes cause neurological problems. So there have been people with coronavirus who've had inflammation in the brain or inflammation in the peripheral nerves, but that's not a particular thing for people with FND. It's just a general thing. Um, yeah. Um, another question, I, I, I think if I'm getting this right, is a gentleman has mentioned that he's been terminally discharged um, okay. with no treatment or program or anything about that from the, um, it looks like it would be the UK health service, okay. you know, maybe a doctor there. How would a patient in a situation like that go about getting additional care or in, other care in general? Um, is there a, 
specific place they can go or contact? I think it's it's tricky uh, not knowing the exact circumstances, but I think it's always within um, your power, or well, it should be anyway, um, to get referred to another doctor. And I think that uh, with that experience, it might be reasonable to be referred back to neurology. Um, that could be in your local service. It could be uh, sort of from a national basis. So I see people from all over the UK. There are other doctors who do so as well. Um, so maybe looking at the FND HOPE website where there's clinicians listed would be a way of, of seeing whether your GP would then refer you on that way. I think it is tricky though, because you know there services are very limited to start with. And also um, it's, uh, it, you know, there are people where current treatments just are not good enough. Okay, and, and that's, I, that's the same for any illness, really. Um, but it is unfortunately the case that there are some people with FND where what we have at the moment doesn't work and there isn't a good, good, good alternative. Um, uh, I think that um, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing that can be done because there's always trying to look after people in the long term and trying to give them some advice. Um, but yeah. It's, it's a difficult situation for people with very severe symptoms. Thank you. Um, I, I know we've taken a lot of your time. Um, if there is anything else that you see specific- <laughs> Looking through there. Um, uh, there's still a, a pretty long list. Um, we, we, so it pops out. Um, I'm just looking through. I see a couple others again with labels and um, psychogenic movement disorder is the same as FND. Uh, yes, there's a lot of different labels. Um, so I think a lot of the labels, uh, you know, they, they, a bit like conversion disorder, like we we're talking about before, they represent theories or theoretical frameworks about thinking about symptoms. And I think whatever the people, so even if we go back to Freud and conversion disorder, he was saying that this is a real thing and it's involuntary. Whatever you think of the theory, he was saying it's real, it's genuine, people are not putting it on. But unfortunately, it's become so contaminated over time by the opposite being thought. And that's, I think, the same uh, for psychogenic. So uh, this term psychogenic makes people feel that the doctor is telling them that there's nothing wrong and that they're doing it to themselves. And I think, to be honest, it makes a lot of doctors and health professionals think like that because they are people as well and they have the same uh, misconceptions that we were talking about before about the split between mind and brain and, and etc. So that's I suppose the reason for the, the, um, the use of the word functional. It's a way of trying to get get some of those that baggage out the way and try and define it in a cleaner way that's just talking about this is a way in which uh, 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 you know, this is a, a real way in which the brain can go wrong. Um, well, and I think having that consistent terminology is important. One, because it, it's very confusing to patients um, trying to have a conversation. Uh, I, I know we've worked together on different projects trying to get terminology changed with medical professionals with starting with the DSM several years ago and then moving into uh, ICD. And, and so there's just, there is a lot of work being done. So I think it's helpful to let patients know that we recognize that is a problem. And as an organization, as medical professionals, we are trying to find a way to navigate through those um, issues and kind of- I, I, I saw a couple of questions there. Um, so there's the, there's somebody with a question about seeing the brain is not working and somebody's had lots of CT scans and MRI scans and nothing's ever shown up. That's because those tests are looking at the structure of the brain. And as we talk about, it's, it, that's not what the problem is. The problem is it's not working properly and you can't see that on scans. And we don't have good tests, investigations that can show that abnormality. And that's just unfortunately the way it is. But it's also true of lots of medical diagnoses that we make, lots of neurological diagnoses we make, are not done because tests are abnormal. They're done because people have certain type of symptoms. Um, 
So that goes for migraine, goes for most people with epilepsy as well. So most people with epilepsy tests are completely normal and it's done on the basis of what the attack is like. And I saw somebody who uh, was asking a question about going to A&E with a first ever seizure and told that two days later had a diagnosis of FND, meant to be transferred for an MRI, but couldn't due to the coronavirus, not sure when going to get a neurology appointment. So I think that's a situation where, uh, you know, it depends how that diagnosis of FND was made. Um, and with one seizure, um, you know, that can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Um, so I think that's a situation where you need to try and talk to your GP, say that this has happened. And I mean, my neuro the neurology department where I work, we run, we're running a service. It may be largely on the phone or by video, but we're running a service and everywhere else should be the same. So there is, is urgent, emergent, urgent and emergency um, uh, neurology cover. And that's a situation for your GP to get in touch with your local neurology service and get them to, to, to see you at least by phone or by video. Well, we often try to remind patients that it's important that sometimes they have to be politely assertive. And, and you know, I think it's always important, even when you feel like that you're getting brushed off to remain respectful and keep things, but it's also okay to follow up if you're not getting the care that you need. Um, if you have been, you know, feel like that you're not being listened to, then there are other avenues to go through. And we encourage, you know, just like any other patient that you, that you file, you know, a complaint if you need to, or whatever, whatever you need to do to get that help. No, I, think it's, I think it's important to be assertive that way. I, I saw a couple of questions here about people who are obviously in really, really difficult situations with long-term admissions um, uh, in places where things are obviously not going very well. Um, it's very hard, again, like the person who asked the question before about being discharged from after being seen, uh, it's very difficult to give advice about that. I think that, uh, you know, again, it's potentially, if, if so if, if a relationship with a clinical team has really broken down, then I think uh, you need to try and resolve it by asking them to arrange a professional's meeting with the person, with the patient themselves, and if the patient wants their family, and try to really have it out in a, in a, in a proper forum, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than sort of phone calls or quick sort of conversations on the ward or angry emails back and forth, it's better to have a be in a room, I know it's difficult at the moment, all together and raise concerns, write down your concerns beforehand, even send them beforehand, um, uh, try to limit the length of that, um, but just to sort of some key points um, and see what you get out of that. If you get absolutely nowhere and you feel you're, you're yeah, that then you need to sort of try and take things a step foot forward. And that would be about trying to get another opinion, I think, about the situation from another, another doctor. And there should be no way really that people are de de denied that possibility. Well, and that's going to happen with a lot of illnesses. There's sometimes that personalities just aren't working out with one another. And it's okay to ask to possibly be, you know, transferred to another doctor or another hospital or something, you know, at least discuss. And I think it's important to be open-minded on both sides that maybe you're not hearing what, um, we, sometimes we're lost in translation. So I think trying to listen to what you're being told and then also how you, you know, speak back and forth respectfully. And um, any other questions that there, there's still, there's a lot, we're, going, we're getting through some of them. Um, I think I see one question here about somebody who needs an operation for the jaw. And I, I think, again, it comes back to the same thing, that if somebody has a clear medical problem that's different from FND that needs treatment, then it just needs to be treated in the way that it would be done normally. Um, so that's just the way it should be. It shouldn't be that the FND stops people accessing treatment that, that in, in that way. Um, Absolutely. A lot of the other questions are just thank yous. Um, everyone really appreciating your time and answering 
the questions for us. Um, this is available on YouTube. It's been YouTube on YouTube Live, so we will check in there and see if there's some questions um, that can be answered as well. Um, anything else that you see that you'd like to answer? I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to have to go, unfortunately, and I'm sorry not to be able to say. I, I, um, you've given us well over the time that we asked, so we, we appreciate. Um, I'm sorry, and I, and I know that there's, there's many people out there with FND, but I think as you can see from tonight, there are, there are lots and lots of people out there with similar problems. So you're not alone in that. Um, and I think this is something which is, um, you know, there's, there's hope that we're going to get better at doing this. I think people with FND have been very, very poorly served for uh, decades, uh, if not centuries, um, by the medical profession. And I think, but I think there's reason to hope that it can get better. Uh, we need all of your help as well. So those of us who are who are working, whether that's in charities, in clinical practice, or in research for people with FND or with people with FND, we need your help too in getting out there and pushing the agenda where, where you can, uh, particularly from a political point of view. So political pressure um, that this is an important issue. Uh, and that resolving it is going to help people. It's going to save money. It's going to, um, uh, yeah, help a lot of people. Um, that's an important message, and it needs to get out there. So, uh, if I can ask for your help in doing that, that would be great. Um, well, and we really appreciate that. And with World FND Month, that is exactly what we're trying to do. We went from a day to a week to a month, trying to get as many people involved as possible. And I just want to remind. Uh, those that are here with us and viewers, that we will have an F&D online conference. We won't be doing Q&A like we have today necessarily, but we do have um, a lot of other speakers that we're trying to bring in that will be talking about brain scans and some um, uh, youth, young adults are going to speak about their lived experience. A lot of our youth are being left out of a lot of these conversations, and it's a really important um, topic as well. So we appreciate your time. We hope that others will try their best to spread awareness, share a message. Um, the more that we can spread that word, um, the more likely we are to get the services that we need. So thank okay. you. Well, best wishes to everyone out there uh, this crazy time. Uh, okay. um, and uh, yeah, keep well. Thank you. Nice Bye. to see you all. Okay, bye-bye.